Project templates make life a lot easier in Logic Pro X by helping you make music more quickly and with more consistent quality. And I made one that you can use for free. After I started using templates, I can't imagine going back to life without them. I mean, seriously, I don't wanna think about it. In this video, we'll walk through what's included in that project template and how to use it. Oh, and did I mention it's only using stock Logic Pro plugins? If you haven't gotten the template yet, go check out this other video first, then come back here to dig into the details of how to actually use it. Diving right in here, let's first take a look at the structure of the project, because as you can see, there are quite a few tracks added here, but we also see that they're organized into these groups or these track stacks. The purpose of this is both for visual organization, so just keep keeping them separated so that I can more easily navigate the project and jump around to these different tracks. And also it has more of a utility purpose of making it easier to mix. So having these allows me to just with one fader control the levels of all of my drum tracks, all of my synths, anything that's rolling up into that group. In addition to using the faders on the mix, I also have some effects on these buses or on these groups where I'm doing some processing on them so that I'm not having to do as much by the time it gets to the master chain. So you can see here on the drum bus, I have a compressor added and that'll just help glue all the drums together, doing the same thing over on the synths and lets me do smaller compression steps along the way instead of trying to knock it all out at once on the master chain later. Another little organization feature I've added to this template are the markers across the top. So if I go to the upper right and click on the button here, go to marker, I can see I have the intros and choruses and everything laid out there uh, on the timeline view. So if you need to change those, you can click in here and change the position, change the length, make those specific to your song. This is great for helping you stay sane while you are editing so that you don't get lost as you're, for example, maybe diving into the automation of the volume level during verse one and then accidentally find yourself suddenly trying to do that in verse two. Having that visualization up here helps you not get lost when you're in those deep edits. Looking back at what's inside of those groups that we looked at earlier, we have a lot of tracks that are already added and I find it way quicker to duplicate tracks to add new instruments or add new vocals than to create a track from scratch. So for example, if I need to add another vocal for an ad lib line or something, I just command D, duplicate, and say box ad lib. Great, I have another vocal track. I can do that for any of these. If I need to, a new synth, I just duplicate it and then open up the instrument library and start finding the right sound from there. On each of these tracks that are included in the template, I also have a plugin chain set up, again, using those stock Logic Pro plugins. So I'll go through the vocal plugin chain here because that's one that people are more generally interested in, and it'll also have the most complex example. So anything else will be simpler than this one. The plugins that we have here, starting with pitch correction, when you're using this in your songs, you'll need to make sure that you change that key so that it matches whatever key your song is in. I have that off in this example. Next, I have an EQ, which is just filtering out a lot of the low end, boosting the high end, dipping some of the low mids. And this is just my best guess at what your raw vocal audio will need as it goes into Logic Pro. You can definitely tweak this and change this depending on what yours needs. The next plugin I have is a de -esser. So we have that taking out some of the S's and toning those down, and then I have two compressors in a row. So this is called serial compression when we're using it back to back like this because they are two compressors in a series, one and then the other. The exact settings of these compressors and any of these other plugins will depend on the song you're using and the specific vocal that you're working with. I know that's gonna sound like a broken record, but it's true. You'll have to tweak them to make sure they match whatever you're using. In general, for um, some pop music or a pop vocal, uh, I'd try to push this first compressor pretty hard where the gain reduction is somewhere between 10 and minus 20 uh, dB here. So you can mess with the threshold here to try to get it so that it's impacting the compressor in that way. The second compressor might not be driving quite as hard as that. And you can see the ratio is also much lower. We've got a ratio of two versus a ratio of eight. But I try to have that somewhere between you know five and 10, depending on the song there. You'll also notice that on that first compressor 
we're also using some soft distortion just built into that compression. What that'll do is just help your vocals pop out a little bit more and adds some harmonics to uh, just give it a little more punch in that mix. After the compressors, we have another de which is just meant to catch any more S's that are maybe brought up a little bit during that compression process. So this will help tone them back further. On either of the de here, if you start to notice that they're driving too hard, and a symptom of that will be the S's start to sound like a lisp or they start to duck out completely and it just sounds awkward, try to increase that threshold or reduce the maximum reduction there to get it so that it sounds more natural. After that second de -esser, we have another channel EQ to capture any more of the low end that, again, might have been brought up by those compressors. And Lastly, we have a gain plugin, and this is because I like to use gain on the automation level instead of automating the volume. So throughout the song, I'll add a gain automation curve and automate individual phrases or verses or entire sections there. And I use that with a gain plugin so that I leave my volume fader free for just adjusting the entire mix level there. So that covers the vocal chain that we have set up on the insert strip here. The next piece are all of these knobs beneath it. So these are our send knobs and we're using those on both the vocal track and other tracks throughout this project to send the audio on that track to our effects on auxiliary tracks. If you're looking for more details on this, you might hear those called uh, send buses or reverb on a bus or a bus reverb, anything like that for reverbs and delays. A few of the reasons that we're using these effects on a bus are one, better control, and two, helps reduce some of the CPU load while running your project. For the better control piece, this allows me to, for example, looking at this first send, it's going to a short reverb, I have the reverb as 100% wet, so instead of if I had the reverb directly on that plug-in chain, where we might have a wet dry knob adjusted and blended in, I can just have that 100% wet here, set the reverb exactly the way I want it, and then I'm affecting it afterwards by cutting out anything outside of that mid-range that I'm letting go through. So if I want a more full reverb, all I have to do is just adjust it here on the EQ and any of the reverb that I'm having audio sent to is affected. The other benefit of having different tracks being sent to this one reverb is that it sounds like it's in the same room because it's all having the exact same reverb applied. So instead of having reverb on every single track, and then if you need to adjust one and want to make them all match, going through and doing it again, this allows you to just adjust it in one place on that auxiliary track. And because we're only using one reverb, that's where it's coming in to save some of the load on your CPU because instead of having those 20 reverbs, you're just having that one reverb plugin. Another benefit on the control side is being able to automate your reverbs more easily. So if I go to my main here and then go to send reverb long absolute, I can now send individual words to that reverb. So if I want a particular word to have way more reverb, I can just increase that send knob here so that as, as it's playing back, we see that it throws that knob all the way up. You'll hear a lot more reverb on that vocal just for that phrase. And you can continue to automate that throughout your project, making it really granular as how you're adding those delays, how you're adding those reverb throws. In addition to having better control on the automation of the send knobs here on your tracks, you can also better control them from the AUGS tracks themselves. So for example, if I have my reverb here and I want to have it cut out as soon as it hits chorus one, then I'm gonna go ahead and just add a gain plugin here like I had on my other track. Because again, I like to automate that, not the volume. Choose gain and we'll go ahead and just drop that here. So now any reverb completely dries up as soon as I hit it because I have that entire AUGS track of my reverb, which is getting audio sends from any tracks that are sending to it, and it's just cutting it out completely. There are also a couple little extras that I've added into this template. One is having sidechain compression set up on the bass so that it dips a little bit whenever the kick hits. So to take a look at that, I'll go to my bass bus here, and we see that the compressor has a little arrow on it. And when I click in, that means that I have something set up on the sidechain here. And this is 
bus 39, which is getting input from our kicks. So when I look back at the kicks, just to see how that was set up, I have a send knob going to kick sidechain. Kick sidechain has no output, so I'm solely using it for setting up this sidechain compression. And what'll happen is anytime that kick hits, it'll dip this bass just a little bit. So that's gonna get you a little more headroom. You really shouldn't notice the sound. If you're seeing it punch way down, I would adjust the threshold so that it's maybe just getting one or two dB out of the way. And that'll also just help your kick punch through a little bit since the kick and bass tend to occupy similar areas in that frequency spectrum. Another nice little extra I've added in here are the multi outputs or the multiple channels for our drum tracks. So on the Detroit Garage and the 808 Flex, those are just one kit, but we have individual channel outputs, which are also showing up as tracks on our timeline view for all of the individual instruments. So when I go back to my Detroit kit here with a quick little example that I've added, we see the MIDI notes are just on our channel one, and I can see the audio coming through on my other individual channel outputs here. And that's gonna let me mix those kicks, toms, hi-hats, snares individually instead of just all at once as one group level. And the same thing is set up over here on the 808 kit. It just lets me have way more granular control on mixing those individual drum kit pieces. Speaking of mixing those individual kit pieces, a couple important notes on that. On my kick and snare, those are the main ones I wanna make sure we cover here. In addition to the plugin chain that I have set up on these, I also have a send knob to something called parallel compression. This is a compressor on an AUGS track, so similar to how we were using the sends to reverb and delay before, but that compressor is just totally destroying uh, or very highly compressing anything that's being sent to it and then we are EQing it out so that it, just some of that mid-range is coming through. And what that lets us do is have a super compressed version of whatever we're sending to it, along with the more dynamic version or less compressed version that's on the main track. So if I'm looking at my kick here, and I start sending to it, and I do the same thing with my snare. So when I click on my snare, I'll find Bus 34, it's that parallel compression. You can hear that tail of the snare starts to become more present and things in that snappier mid-range start to come through better. So this is just one style of parallel compression. There's actually another one called NYC or New York City style compression, where instead of letting the mid-range through, you actually end up boosting the low and the high end so that it is uh, making it snappier and bassier. So it'll, it'll look something a little more like this. You know, those are both options, both are valid. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as this for the starting point in the template, but feel free to change that to whatever sounds best with your song. The last piece I'll walk through here is the mastering chain that's included on this template. You can find that mastering chain by clicking on any of your buses and seeing the output go to stereo out and having the plugin chain right there. Or you can just scroll to the bottom and find it set up as its own track here. The point of mastering is to make any final adjustments on the overall sound of your song, as well as bring it up to a standard commercial level loudness. Hopefully this plugin chain is a helpful starting point for you as you develop your own mastering process. Walking through it, we have our first two plugins as channel EQs, and those are just cutting out low end. So in general, these are not frequencies that a lot of people are going to hear. So I'm just gonna cut them out completely. I'm having two plugins there because it's 48 dB per octave and I wanna cut out even more than that. Next up, we have an exciter, which is going to bring out some of the harmonics of your song more, so you can adjust the level of your harmonics as well as which frequency it's focused on. Next up, we have our limiter, and that's what brings the song up to your final loudness level. I use this in conjunction with the loudness meter that's after that in the plugin chain. There's lots of debate on how loud your masters should be. The only thing I'll say on this is louder is not always better, and don't let that trick your ears as you're going through the mastering process. What I mean by that is, 
a lot of the streaming services that you would use have a standard level of loudness and they try to make all the songs match that so that it doesn't drastically change how loud things are for the listener. So if you submit a song, for example, to Spotify, which I think is minus 14 dB right now for its standard loudness level, and your song is minus 7 dB, they're going to bring your volume of your song way down. So as you're mastering, make sure that you're adjusting how you're listening to it for any gain that you're adding in. And to do that, for example, if you're adding 10 dB, try decreasing the output just during the process of listening, not during the actual export. So you can have an accurate picture of how your song sounds when you're pushing it hard into the limiter versus, let's say, toning it back to only plus 5 dB where it's a more dynamic mix and you're not pushing that limiter as hard. So while the mastering setup will depend on your song and music style, a general rule that I use for trying to get the right level is hitting around minus nine dB on the short-term loudness. To test this, make sure you go ahead and set your output back to zero here if you changed that when you were listening to the effects of the limiter, and then go ahead and click start and play it through your song. Baby. This example is so sparse that it's not going to really be useful to look through, but again, just try to look for that loudest point in your song hitting around minus 9 dB. Also remember that this template is just a starting point for you. As you use it and figure out things that work better for you, you can go ahead and make that into your own template. To do that, we're going to want this to be a blank project again, so if you were working on one, go ahead and save that first, and then let's go ahead and delete everything, delete any automation. Make sure that it's basically at our starting point again. Also check in the project files up here and just delete anything that might be added there. And next, just go to file, save as template, and name that whatever you want. Now, next time you create a project, you'll be able to choose that awesome new template that is customized just the way you like it. If you found this video helpful to your music making process, please pass it along to a friend they think will also find it helpful. Thanks for watching. I'm Marcus of Cradle Cat, and I'll see you next time.